Good afternoon uh, or good evening or good morning, you know, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to our January third Thursday uh, gathering. Um, we're so delighted <clears throat> to see you all. Uh, we have uh, a really uh, great program uh, talking about some of the highlights from the recent transportation research board meetings. Uh, which were held in Washington, D.C. about two weeks ago. Um, but before we get to the program, uh, I did want to make a few announcements. You know, we have these uh, meetings um, in part to catch up with each other and to share information and good news, uh, and then also to connect with each other which I think is uh, really important in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, and so I, I have a couple of, uh, of announcements and staff changes. Uh, the first is um, Lydia Morikawa has been promoted to Associate Director of Course Development uh, and Delivery. I want to thank Lydia for all of her hard work and uh, coordinating, managing, uh, and implementing really our core business, which is the development and delivery of uh, FEMA certified training courses as part of the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Um, another announcement is that uh, Ricky uh, Machida is going to be moving into a new position with us. Um, and Ricky's just completed his master's in library science. Uh, and so he's going to be taking on the role as our digital resource manager. So uh, many of you have worked closely with uh, Ricky in the, in the past and uh, it, it's, it's really great to have him uh, continue in this, uh, this important role. Um, also joining us today in person with their black shirts on uh, are, is uh, Julie Chun, who's going to uh, be working as our business uh, manager, uh, and then Karen Awana, who is uh, uh, in the role of our program support specialist. And so uh, these two people are new to our team, but they've really helped in terms of uh, coordinating and communicating and helping to facilitate uh, several of our uh, different projects. So uh, those are the announcements that I have to make. Um, we also have an award to give a, a 10 year service award uh, to, to Brandon. Uh, I don't know if he's on, but uh, you'll be receiving that from the RCOH. He's been with us for 10 years. Uh, Brandon is part of the team that helps to ensure that our systems work, that our uh, information technologies that are different platforms, digital platforms that we're using, uh, function effectively for the development and delivery of our uh, training courses and the research that we do. So, well, I'd like to start by, you know, welcoming you to a new year, uh, to a new uh, semester. Um, Lots going on, lots of new students, uh, lots of new projects uh, that have gotten started. And what we're going to do today is talk about some of the highlights from uh, the 2023 Transportation Research Annual Meetings, which were held in Washington, D.C. Now, I've been going to these meetings for more than 30 years, right? Every January. At the start of the spring semester, I usually miss the first classes because of the TRV meetings. And I've been involved with different committees and different task forces. And uh, because a lot of the work that we do with the center and in urban planning is tied to uh, transportation, transportation functionalities. You know, in addition to the sessions and the poster sessions, we're going to have some presentations summarizing the poster sessions and some of the takeaways from the many uh, uh, activities at the uh, TRB meetings. Uh, it was really great to see people um, face to face in person. You know, for the last three years, we've primarily had a lot of Zoom calls, canceled meetings, 
and disruptions associated with it. And while the numbers still haven't reached the pre-pandemic levels, usually we have like 14,000 people attending uh, the TRB meetings. This year there was 11,000, know, which is still a, a large crowd. And so uh, it was great to see people, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, in person, to uh, to get together and to catch up with many of our uh, former students, colleagues, and others from across the country uh, that that we were able to meet up with uh, in DC for this annual event. Uh, we also did an, uh, an event uh, for the journal that I edit, Transportation Research Interdisciplinary Perspectives. Um, you know, we have good news to uh, present about that, uh, about that journal. Our impact score is uh, 9.75 uh, right now. Last year, we had more than 1.2 million downloads of papers from across uh, Across the uh, across the world, I mean, the leading countries in terms of downloads uh, are the U.S., China, and the United Kingdom. But uh, the journal is being well read, and uh, and we've been working to shorten the turnaround time, but also increase um, you know the quality of the reviews. And and so I know many of you on this call have been involved with. Uh, trip, and I hope that you'll continue to be uh, engaged with, uh, with with that journal as well as well too. Uh, you know, for that journal, we we did a special issue. We actually have done now three special issues on the pandemic. Uh, and we've published more than two hundred papers uh, on the impact of the pandemic uh, on transportation systems, but also the response. Uh, to the pandemic by different uh, transportation systems agencies and, and users as well too. And we're continuing to learn and understand more about what works and what doesn't work and uh, the important role that transportation assets play, not just in terms of the, the management and response to the pandemic, um, but also in terms of the longer term recovery. And so part, uh, we're gonna be starting issue number, special issue number four uh, on, the, on the pandemic. And we're particularly interested uh, in research that uh, is on the longer term changes that have come because of the, the pandemic uh, and so forth. So in addition to those topics, uh, TRIP also focuses on many of the urgent, important, compelling topics that are coming out about uh, climate, climate impacts uh, on uh, transportation systems, on supply chains, on freight, uh, the impacts of different types of natural and human caused hazards uh, and threats. And then the critical role of new technologies, and whether we're talking about connected vehicles or automated vehicles or connected automated vehicles or micro mobility or ride sharing systems, there are lots and lots of really important transportation uh, related topics uh, that uh, we're continuing to conduct research on. Today's session is really focused on transportation. And we have uh, three or four uh, excellent uh, presentations um, about some of the research that we've been doing. Uh, we we uh, presented on porous pavements. We presented on agent-based modeling of uh, the spread of the pandemic. Uh, I presented a session on climate change and the impact on rural transportation needs. Uh, and then uh, Julie, uh, has been very involved with uh, our efforts to work with the College of Engineering to restore our LTAP um, program as well, too. And, and we'll talk a little bit about LTAP and uh, tribal uh, TTAP program as, as well, too. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to uh, our three presenters. I've asked them to take about 10 minutes each and just hit the highlights uh, of uh, their presentations, 
but also some of the takeaways and implications for the work that we do as part of National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, our University Transportation Center, and the Department of Urban Regional Planning. So Dave, you ready? I am. Yeah, so Dave is one of our PhD students uh, and uh, has been uh, very much involved in our, our paper on porosity. Yeah. Right, and we're gonna be taking that different places as we move forward here. Um, it was really a pleasure to attend TRD this time. Um, I went to several different sessions and I saw a lot of different technologies and, um, and a lot of people working on different uh, research projects uh, and they presented them through their posters. But today I'm gonna to talk about three sessions that were particularly relevant to what we're trying to do in, here in Hawaii right now. Um, first of all, um, I attended a session on green infrastructure and specifically they talked about the evaluation of pollutants approximate to highways and how to mitigate those with green infrastructure. Um, then I went to a disaster mitigation session and they talked about the development of uh, web-based network improvement analyses tools. And finally, the keynote speech was given by uh, the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm and the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, and they talked about how they're going to try to evolve the transportation fleet in the near future. Next slide, please. And uh, for these three projects, um, the main method for the evaluation of uh, pollution, uh, roadside particulate matter, sedimentary matter as well, uh, was the installation of monitors in Philadelphia and other places. Um, the reason these are important is because they have found that there has been a lot of accumulation that has not been dealt with up to this point. So they want to try to implement green infrastructure and see if they can reduce those numbers. Um, the development of an open source web tool. This is important because it is open source. And so anybody can edit it with Python and it's meant to be a first cut when you change a network with different conditions and with different arterial insertions. How does that affect the, the operations of that network and whether and it tells you whether or not it's going to be cost effective. And finally, a shift to electric vehicles and alternative energy sources. This was talked about at length by Buddha Judge at Granholm, but they also got into some of the things that Dr. Kim talked about earlier, um, especially the installation of hydrogen cells in marginalized or underprivileged neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Um, the findings and results of these projects, uh, very quickly, um, they found that airborne and sedimentary pollutants on freeways or by freeways are an ongoing issue. And this is a really important thing to consider because even though we're transitioning to electric vehicles, we're still going to have emissions from the material degradation of cars and other types of vehicles. So even though we have electric vehicles, we're still gonna have sedimentary accumulation. Um, the USDOT network ROI tool has produced promising results, but it has not been tested anywhere uh, further west than Houston, Texas. And therefore there are opportunities to verify that tool to a greater degree so that people can get more um, reliable results out of it. And finally, the US aims to have a more resilient transportation network. Um, the main focus of Buttigieg and Granholm was the transition to electric vehicles, but they did also talk about public transportation and alternative energy. Um, however, that was kind of secondary to the incentivizing of the purchasing of electric vehicles. Next slide, please. Implications for research, and these are going to be also uh, mostly relevant to Hawaii. Um, the emissions warrant further scrutiny in different venues. Obviously, we have a, a freeway here in Honolulu that cuts right through the center of the city. And so, and we also have houses that are right by the freeway. So it is uh, of interest to monitor how much matter is accumulating from these sources and whether or not we need to take maybe green infrastructure imp implementation measures to mitigate it. Um, we want to use easy to use network evaluation tools. Um, that needs to be tested in different venues and we want to get involved in that project by making ourselves available and contacting these people. And we would encourage other places in the Western United States to do the same. And finally, uh, public transportation seems to be secondary. I mentioned this before. Um, public transportation was brought up at the prompting of some of the other um, people who were running the session with Buttigieg and Granholm. But I think really it's incumbent upon those of us to make projects that address public transportation so they, it brings it to an equivalent level of electric vehicles. Next slide, please. 
And when I was at my poster session, I presented a paper that had been written and researched by Dr. Kim, Dr. Riley, and other colleagues. Um, I made a small uh, contribution to this paper. Um, and this is for the implementation of permeable pavement in Hawaii, which you, as, as far as I can tell, which we do not have much of that right now. Um, we want to install this pavement in places where it can both mitigate flooding and also enable us to capture water for recycling because water security is an ongoing issue here in Hawaii. Um, there are possible sites for this. Um, and ideally, it can absorb 65 or 80 percent of the runoff in the ideal zones. However, at this meeting, it was brought up to me that the water table is a real concern in Hawaii because obviously we're at sea level on the sides of the island. So maybe testing this farther inland is a better idea. So we have to narrow our potential pilot sites based on that criteria. Next slide, please. Implications for research regarding the poster project specifically, we need a pilot. Um, there are opportunities to collaborate on that, both with the state DOT and researchers here in the Civil Engineering Department here at Hawaii. So um, it is going to be one of my areas of emphasis to see if I can get this project to a more advanced stage. And um, the ideal areas for analysis of this are inland slopes, because this is where runoff occurs. Obviously, if it pools, it, that's a problem in terms of flooding, but water will sit in those places. And we want to find out whether or not we can actually reduce the amount of heavy runoff during uh, major precipitation events. Next slide, please. And the takeaways I got from all of this. Um, our freeway configuration, as I mentioned before, this is something we need to be cognizant of, even as we transition towards other alternatives and probably generate some more projects related to the other pollutants that will remain even after electric vehicles will become the dominant form of transportation. Um, we want to be involved in the development of national transportation tools and planning tools, not only the one I mentioned, but any other open source material that is generated at the national level. Hawaii's geographic and economic challenges are something that we have to consider because even though they might be incentivizing the purchasing of electric vehicles, um, Hawaii does have a very high cost of living. So maybe rapidly trans transitioning to those kind of vehicles is not um, an ideal situation for us. And finally, um, the potential for transportation to assist with other problems. Um, this is obviously epitomized by the implementation of permeable pavement because it serves two purposes in addition to making the transportation itself overall more resilient in the state. And obviously it can mitigate flooding, but it can also help us with the environmental concern of water security. And on the final slide, I have links to the projects that I talked about in this presentation. And um, the only thing that's different is the paper by Dr. Kim and Dr. Riley at the bottom is their one on vetiver grass, because that's one that is also related to the green infrastructure that we're, that we're exploring at this school. Um, that is all I have, and now I will pass it along to my next colleague. I think it would be Farnhouse, right? She's going to discuss her experiences at TRP. Yes, right. uh, it was a great pleasure to participate in TRB. It was so big event. Actually, I it was my first time that I attended this this meeting, and they had more than four thousand presentations. So. There were a variety of fields of study and I choose some of them that they were interesting for me. First, I want to speak about the poster presentation that we had uh, in the TRB meeting. This presentation or this study is done by uh, me, Professor Kim and Eric Yamashita. And then I will go over some interesting things that I learned from TRB and share some of them with you. Uh, in this slide, uh, I try to present how our uh, ABM model works. The topic of our uh, poster presentation was simulating the spread and contaminants of COVID-19 in an urban reserve district using agent-based modeling. We used so many detailed data about the streets, about the location of the buildings, the land use type, the population who are living, working, or just visiting the YPT. We we find each people or each individual in the YPT as an agent, and then we started to model how they move around, how they go to the public locations, how they go to the shopping centers, restaurants, and they come to the close contact with other exposed or infected agents. 
And based on their situation, if they have mask or if they have the vaccination status, then they have a probability of getting the infection. And finally, using this uh, modeling, we could estimate how many COVID cases we can have in different situations with implementing different policies. And the figure that uh, you can see here is the NetLogo interface on the left side down. And you see that we have so many parameters that we can change and see their impacts on the uh, COVID cases. And so we can decide which policies fit better for us. We implemented different scenarios to see the impact on the results. And uh, the figure here shows the results of some of the scenarios. As you can see, the worst case scenario is when we have less testing and contact tracing. And the best case is when we have more testing and contact tracing. And actually it shows the importance of contact tracing for us. And also we found that even if 90% of the people get vaccinated, again, the virus will continue to spread and we will have some new cases, but maybe not that much severe. All in all, this study showed that ABM is really helpful tool to just simulate the situation, see what the outcome of different policies and choose the best one. When I was presenting this poster, this study in the TRB, some researchers and professors from different universities came across to my presentation and had some great ideas. One of the most interesting ones uh, was from a professor from one of the Florida's university. And he mentioned that we have, we, we have some data about how many cases we have, and we use them to compare the results of our study with them. But usually they are under detected because so many people, they don't get tested. They go, don't go to the lab to get tested. So we don't have the real data about how many people they get tested. This professor was suggesting me to use the fatality rate to estimate the number of COVID daily cases and compare the results of my study with them. And when I just searched about it, I found that, yeah, that's correct. And some other researchers are working in this field and it's a very good idea. And also based on my findings, testing and contact tracing is very important. So many people were just suggesting to use more technology to help to do the contact tracing process more efficiently since it's really important it's, and very impactful. Besides the poster presentation, I had chance to just participate in different uh, sessions and learn more about the cutting edges, new researchers, new methods, and new findings. Uh, in November 2021, President Biden signed 1.2 trillion infrastructure law. And the aim of this uh, law is actually uh, rebuild the, the bridges, the roads, and the infrastructure that we have, and also some other goals. But it was interesting that from this bill, 7.5 billion is considered to build for nationwide charging stations for electric cars or EVs. And uh, the goal is actually expedite the process of ad adoption of EVs and finally reach the net zero carbon emission across the United States in transportation. But like any other uh, policies or like any other tools, there are some disadvantages too. Some people, including uh, Jennifer Homendy, the National Transportation Safety Board Chair mentioned that uh, we have safety issues with electric cars because if we have heavier cars, then the fatality rate in accidents on the roads will be higher. And the electric cars are heavier than gas powered cars. So that's a problem. And they were thinking that we should have some new laws, new regulations, new policies to improve the safety as well because we don't have more fatality on our roads. Another the, one of the disadvantage of electric cars is on disasters. Natural disasters and electricity outages are not uncommon events, and usually they happen when we have hurricanes, we have flooding. So it's so probable that we don't have power, we don't have electricity. But uh, when we have no power, so we can't use our car, and they will be use, useless. It, it, 
This was problem when we wanted to evacuate in hurricanes and also when heat waves uh, just hit some location. And also uh, in some disasters such as flooding, when water goes inside the battery, it will cause a short circuit and then the battery will be dead and the car will be useless. So it's another disadvantage. We need to think about them and try to improve the situation and um, maybe help to improve it in future. Next slide. I also had a chance to uh, attend in some sessions about artificial intelligence because I was so interested to learn more about how we can use artificial, artificial intelligence or AI in transportation and how we currently are using these. Uh, I found out that so many companies are using AI and uh, some video that they are recording from their roads to just detect the condition or assess the pavement condition of the roads. And they identify cracks and then we can improve the infrastructure in the locations that we need. If we do this with AI, it's four times faster than the situation that we are doing with human. And also it will be more accurate and less expensive almost half the price of the situation when we use people to do the same thing. And also we use AI for pathfinding. Some software such as Google Map, Waze, they are using AI to process the data, they predict the traffic, and then they estimate the time that we need to just move from location A to location B. So it's useful in these fields too, although we can use it for controlling the traffic lights. Traffic lights are um, working timely in timely manner, but we can manage their time by seeing the videos, the traffic flows in different lines, and then change it and try to manage the traffic more efficiently. And artificial intelligence also makes the self-driving cars a reality. It's very interesting that uh, in so many states is now lawful that companies, they test their self-driving cars in, on the road. And they use sensors, cameras, and also the radars to collect the data about the environment, about the location that they are, and then they process it with using AI, and then the car will make decision to move forward and go to the destination. And besides, it's not just for self-driving cars. In our usual cars, we have so many sensors that we use AI to just prevent to improve the safety and prevent accidents. For example, if somebody is in your blind spot, your car may, may see that and just try to warn you. And uh, these are some of other innovations that I could see some companies are working on that and I found them interesting. One company was using AI to generate the safety scores for the road. And then we can just use this data to just improve them. And also, as we mentioned, electric vehicles are so popular these days, and some companies are just collecting data about that, about their movements across the, across the America and how which states use them more, how they impact the life, and so many things. And also, one of the things that I think is maybe for future and it's more conceptualized now is uh, the advanced air mobility, which some companies, including NASA, are working on that right now. And the concept says that we should carry the things, the goods and the people using the aircraft and using the air transportation, which will, we, we will have less traffic and also we will just reach our destination faster. And also it was interesting for me that we have so many data and I saw so many companies that they are just working with data to just categorize them, prepare them for use, and it was a big challenge. And yet that was some of my synthesis that I could learn and I would have to share with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Dave and uh, Barnas, you know, for uh, your summary of both the uh, posters, the sessions that you presented at, but also I really appreciated how you pulled out uh, interesting uh, developments. And I hope this is useful in your work as you're developing your own uh, research uh, agenda. 
Our next speakers are going to talk about LTEP. I met Julie many, many years ago when she was really the program manager for our LTEP uh, program at the University of uh, Hawaii. And, and so uh, I think we're trying to get this uh, restarted in partnership with the College of Engineering, in, in, in particular, uh, Professor Bo Ui Zhang, who I work very closely with, is one of the associate editors for TRIP, and we've had a long uh, partnership with College of Engineering. So maybe, Julie, you can give us a little bit of background on LTAP and, and where, uh, where that's headed. So I had the pleasure of attending at TRB the National Local Technical Assistance Program or LTAP um, meeting, their annual winter meeting. But just some background about LTAP. So in 1982, the Federal Highway Administration established this program to work with all the state departments of transportation and the counties um, in each state to develop the LTAP programs there. And the goal was really to foster this safe, um, transportation system by training um, the local workforce and some of the decision makers involved. So currently there's 51 LTAP centers, there's one in every state, and then there's one in Puerto Rico, but they also have seven TTAP or Tribal Technology Assistance Program centers. Next slide. Um, so at the meeting, they talked about the great success of expanding their programs you know, because of COVID, they started to do these hybrid trainings with online and in-person trainings. Um, the 2022 results aren't in yet, but in 2021, they trained over 176,000 local agencies with about 5,100 workshops. So they've been very successful in this type of training. Um, LTAP also partners with different organizations such as the National Highway Institute, the American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials, um, NACE, which is the National Association of County Engineers, and the American Public Works Association, and, and other organizations as well that help, you know, enhance the programs through training. So they work very closely with the FHWA Local Aid Support Program, which really focuses on workforce development and technology which is really needed, especially in, in, in all the states right now. Next slide. Um, we have Karen Awana with us right now, and she's gonna talk a little bit about the Tribal Technical Assistance Program. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Awana, and I'm a new member to the NDTCC team. And I'd like to share with you about the Tribal Technical Assistance Program, also known as TTA. Um, it was established in 1991, and the purpose for this program is similar to the LTAP, um, training, technical assistance, e-learning, and so on, except for the fact that this program focuses on federally recognized tribes, and it also includes the state of Hawaii. And when we're looking at federally recognized tribes, it's about 574 tribes are recognized throughout the United States. Last year, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Biden administration allocated $17.8 million to the TTAP program nationwide. The TTAP is just one of a part of a larger tribal transportation infrastructure program, which is um, a total amount of $3 billion. So the 17.8 million focuses simply on the technical assistance and training. And this announcement was made last year of January. It's a five-year program, so we're looking at starting on that um, fourth year. There are seven regional centers, as Julie had made mention, throughout the United States, and Hawaii is attached to the Western Center. Currently, it's being administered with the National Indian, in Indian Justice Center located in California. Um, just a last note, according to the FHWA website, the LTEP program requires a 50% non-federal match. So the federal government will provide 50% and whether or not the state um, provides the other 50 or a uh, private donor, that's up to um, the state that's administering it. However, with the TTAP, the percent federally funded is 100%. 
making this program a great opportunity as well as the LTAP program to benefit the people of our state. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So finally, as um, Dr. Kim mentioned, we are going to be partnering with the UH College of Engineering and with Dr. Zhang, hopefully to bring the LTAP program and to reestablish it here in Hawaii and then incorporate the TTAP program as well. Thank you. This is some of the activities. So, Eric, I'm not sure if you want to read this. I, I can, since I wrote this up. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I, in this slide, I'm kind of describing some of the activities, research activities we're doing to support our, our training. Um, so, as most of you might know, we have courses on evacuation, damage assessment, or debris management. So for our evacuation course, we're working on several activity research activities tied to FRA and other um, other agencies tied to wildfires and evacuation. And so one of the things we're looking out for the, uh, with the FRA is this Chrissy homework, and then we're looking at using you know how how to use uh, rail assets and operations for evacuation assistance with wildfire response, as well as looking at applying sensors and other technologies that we, we've been experimenting with uh, to uh, determine where are the areas along rail corridors that are um, more frequently having uh, these issues with wildfires. Um, some of the other activities we're doing for to support our damage assessment, um, maybe, you know, Jay holds on the, on the call as well, but He's been involved in a lot of our um, machine learning uh, activities. So we've been trying to integrate uh, our satellite imagery, drone imagery, especially our 360 imaging, which is more terrestrial um, of, of the disaster areas. Like we've, we've uh, sent out our team to uh, Hurricane um, Ian in Florida, Hurricane Ida in uh, Louisiana, and several of the Incidents that occurred in, uh, I think it's Kentucky, for the tornadoes. Uh, so we have a whole library of 360 images, and we've been working with some of our grad students to integrate these uh, technologies. With, so what we're calling a rapidly integrated damage assessment, which integrates models, satellite imagery, drone imagery, and the 360 imagery with the machine learning. So. Hopefully, once we get this all uh, you know, put together and into a framework that uh, works well, we can uh, support FEMA first responders in emergency management. One of the other things that we're looking at uh, for our disaster degree is uh, also looking at the machine learning. And so, after um, the, I guess it was the fire, the wildfires in Boulder, uh, we used the machine learning technologies uh, also to identify what, what the debris are, uh, like the classification of the debris. Next slide. This might be difficult to read, but these are um, some of the other activities we have with that's tied to transportation is uh, tied to our Pacific Southwest Region University Transportation Center, which uh, is led by USC as the lead institution. In, that uh, the UTC's primary mission is to uh, conduct research in transportation, conduct um, education and training programs and workforce development, as well as uh, technology transfer. And so for the research activities, we've been funding our researchers within our university to conduct their uh, certain research projects um, related to transportation. And you can, as you can see on this slide, it's kind of small text, but We've, we've finished uh, three projects from 20, it was 2018 to 2021. Um, even uh, during COVID, there was some, you know, some hiccups, but uh, we're, we have two other projects that are we're trying to finish up this year. Um, I think that's, that's Okay, well, as you can see, we have a lot 
going on here. Uh, and some of this is research, research and development, kind of works underway, works in progress. You know, our job is to try to integrate the academic research of our graduate students, our doctoral students, our master's students, and actually some of our undergraduate students as well, too. And so part of this is about capacity building, and giving content and experiences that can be incorporated into dissertations and master's theses and capstone papers and so forth. We're also trying to support the research, research and development activities of our faculty uh, in Hawaii, at the University of Hawaii, across different uh, colleges and universities, but also with our partners uh, at other universities as well too. Eric mentioned the University Transportation Center that we're part of with uh, USC and several other California, Arizona, um, Nevada uh, are also part of that group as, as well too. And so we will continue to work and bring these sorts of assets uh, together. So I hope uh, this uh, overview has helped in terms of identifying both the directions that we're uh, headed in. And I think they're, they're really two. I mean, some of them have to do with the technologies. I mean, and part of what we're trying to do is to understand and master and use the technologies. But the other part of it that I think is really important is addressing urgent community needs. Uh, needs for resilience, needs for sustainability, but also related to social equity, social justice, and other concerns, which were big themes at the uh, TRB uh, conference. And I think uh, for us, part of this relates to the workforce development, training, capacity building, but it also involves working in underserved uh, communities that are at high risk of harm, at, uh, harm from natural hazards, but also ongoing uh, hazards and threats. So with that, I'd like to open it up for any discussion or comments from the people. Let's, let's turn to the, uh, to the Zoom side. Anyone uh, from, uh, who's on from Zoom? Uh, I, I know several of you were at the TRB meetings. Uh, I, I don't want to call anyone out, but are there any questions or comments or things that stood out, takeaways from the TRB meeting? Are there questions on the side? Yeah. Yeah. No. Are there no questions on the side? No questions. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up to those in the room here. Uh, Charles or uh, George, we have George Dada with us, Ginger, any, any, any uh, thoughts or reactions to the excellent presentations by Dave, Barnaz, uh, Julie, and Karen, right? Just to learn right now, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh -huh. I guess with the climate change, it's gonna be even more interesting now. Yeah, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that really is uh, something that needs to be addressed, especially in island locations, especially in remote places like that. Uh, the costs continue to, to rise. I just saw the uh, 2022 NOAA billion dollar uh, disasters map that they produce every year. And so that's, that, that, that's come out. And so I think that there is a sense of urgency that we need to do more, that we're not doing enough, and we need to really work on uh, some of these other uh, issues as well, too. Uh, I see, is Sequoia still on? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah, Sequoia, it was great seeing you, however, briefly in, in DC. Uh, Sequoia is one of our uh, recent PhD graduates from the, from the program. Uh, and and uh, Sequoia, update us on what you're what you're what you're what you're doing, and, and any reactions. I mean, you worked on 
both the porosity paper and then our uh, other paper on uh, vetiver and, and nature-based solutions. So tell us, uh, tell us, share with us the good news in terms of what you're up to these days. Yes, so I just uh, got a job position um, or earned a job position as a research associate at the Houston Advanced Research Center or HARC as they call it for short. Um, I'm starting uh, the very first day of February, so I'm really looking forward to that. And the research is focused on not just uh, water issues, but also energy and uh, other climate issues as well. Um, but of course, I will stay in touch with NDPTC for collaboration projects um, and going to discuss about the paper. David did a really good job on presenting uh, and summarizing very well on what the uh, per porous pavement paper is about. And uh, I'm glad, and thank you, David, for also connecting it with uh, with the Vetiver paper. Thank you for discussing that. Um, if, just to kind of summarize on what the Vetiver paper focuses on, it's focused on uh, basically reducing multi-hazards, which is not just flooding, but also landslides and uh, soil erosion. Um, and we did a case study, Dr. Kim and I, we focused on a case study analysis in North Shore Kauai as uh, that area experienced all three of those issues. And we found that very relevant to um, to Olawai. I mean, minus the landslides, uh, of course, and the soil erosion. Uh, there's there's still like a difference with porous, porous pavement and what vetiver can do. But overall, um, the purpose is the same is to reduce flooding overall. Well, yeah, it's great to hear about your successes uh, that you've uh, that that you that you've been moving on. We miss you here uh, in Hawaii and hope that you'll have occasion to come back and, and, and visit us. Uh, you're again, one of our, uh, the proud uh, uh, alumni of our PhD program here. So it's it's great to, to hear from you. I think the other thing that's really important is that we, as Dave pointed out, we really need to do more in terms of uh, thinking about porous pavements because we're taking all of this precious freshwater rainwater and letting it flow largely into the ocean. And if there are ways that we can recharge our aquifers, if there are ways in which we can uh, capture some of the, the benefits of porous pavements in terms of pollution reduction and so forth, I think that's, uh, that, that's a, a really important. So our paper was to try to identify uh, a framework for thinking about uh, where we should be testing these uh, porous pavements. And some of this has to do with the uh, traffic volumes or the mix of traffic or the size of the vehicles, but so much else has to do with the, the slope, the conditions of uh, the area, the, uh, the, the surrounding uh, land use and development and, uh, and the potential for uh, absorbing this. And so, uh, that paper, we you know we've got lots of comments and revisions on it, so I'm I'm hopeful that it will be accepted shortly, and we'll be able to send it out more widely uh, for uh, dissemination and uh, discussion. You know, the other work that Arnaz has been doing is uh, we we published a paper in Transportation Research D, Transport and Environment, uh, on using agent-based modeling for tsunami evacuation. And we looked at a number of different scenarios, you know, with bit bridges, uh, creating the new pedestrian bridge or creating, uh, you know, uh, other types of uh, uh, strategies for uh, improving the detection alert and warning system. So, uh, and, and I think this, this agent-based modeling is a really powerful tool when it comes down to thinking about different choices that people make. You know, they can choose to wear a mask or not. They can choose to take a certain mode of transportation, to go to a certain activity area and so forth. And the power of this tool is being able to bring together all of these, you know, decisions, these decision alternatives, and then evaluate the consequences of them. And so, uh, and Farnas has been doing a really excellent job uh, in terms of uh, agent-based modeling and applying it in terms of these sorts of, of tools. 
I'm hopeful that other PhD students that are in the room that are on the call today will uh, will will learn from uh, Sequoia and Dave and, and Farnas in terms of the, the good progress uh, that, that that they're making. So, any other comments or thoughts uh, from anyone? Oh, uh, Suwan. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for the great presentations. Uh, I really enjoy all the new topics you guys bring up and great uh, excellent research findings. So uh, one of the thoughts while I was listening to you guys' presentation is that there's a, a lot of data new tools are going on and keep evolving, right? So I was thinking that uh, we, we all learn something new and then we all know something that's related to our own fields. But sure, um, just uh, moving forward, like transportation planning is not only a transportation issue, there's more and more interdisciplinary solutions are being caught. So I was thinking that sure, if there can be a shared, um, like, uh, shared documents that whenever we find something like new, like uh, whether it's data available or open source tools are available, if we can put that in a shared document and organize them in a way by subject matters. And then I think it, it collaboratively we can just have access to much more data and tools available for doing interdisciplinary research. Yeah, we have our data archivist here, right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be working on, on doing this and we've been looking at different models and platforms for uh, sharing this data, accessing this data, controlling uh, this data and managing this. Um, Suwan, I'm so glad that you joined us. Professor Shen is actually one of our leading researchers right now focusing on resilience hubs. I mean, in addition to all the other work that she's been doing on sea level rise and other sorts of impacts of uh, climate change and uh, especially in coastal areas, uh, Professor Shen has been doing really good work in thinking about uh, resilience hubs and uh, uh, so forth. So, uh, so do you want to say a little bit about the work that you're doing on the resilience hubs as well? Sure. Um, yeah, so the resilience hub idea is there. Um, it's a very good example about how research can be used for the real life for decision making. So this uh, resilience hub planning is uh, we, we get this uh, we are working with the city and county uh, of Honolulu climate change and resilience sustainability and resilience office, and then we're getting the funding from the FEMA like the hazard mitigation grants, and uh, the idea is really about how can we do our asset based or, uh, community centered um, um, research approach, and Cole has taken the lead on that. we been doing his. Uh, Great six days work and then Kingdom carried forward for using tracking GIS data and then doing <coughs> surveys, data tracking to uh, support the decision making. And currently, we are in the third phase, which is we are in the <coughs> communities across the island and then try to say how does all this research, all this um, data analysis can. Be came into something that should support the decision making at the local level. And how can we embed, for example, lo local native Hawaiian culture into this decision making process? And uh, also, like uh, in terms of not only thinking about just a uh, physical structure, but thinking more collaboratively, who are the stakeholders that can be involved, what are the issues that need to be addressed in the practical world to take this research to support. Uh, Building the community residents at the local level at different uh, planning regions and the neighborhood. So we are currently doing uh, collaborating with the Kapiolani Community College, and they are doing a lot of uh, community engagement workshops. In the upper coming, we have six more community workshops uh, um, between January and March, and also we are going to do a stakeholder discussion group meeting. Um, like uh, just uh, um, from the more feasibility uh, point of view. How much it costs to overcome the challenges uh, by consulting the experts uh, in the field. Great, great. Thank you, Suwan. Uh, I, I see Junot is on. Uh, he's not? He is. He is. Junot, can you hear me? Yes, Carl, I hear you, but I'm in the class right now, but uh, we're good to see you. Right so, so you can't, you can't update us. We're going to have to bring you in. But Judith is coming from Iowa. You know, he, he's left us and he's taken a position uh, in, in Iowa as a faculty member. 
And so it's great to uh, at least see your name on on the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we are yeah. we are getting another another polar vortex this week, so we are we are getting ready for that. Okay, okay. Well, it, it's great to see you, um, Dave. You were gesturing. Was there something else you wanted to I, say? I just wanted to open chat because there were some baby some messages popping up in chat. To see if anybody had any questions. <laughs> Oh, yeah, just no, thank you. No questions. No questions. <laughs> yeah, there are no questions. Charles. Oh, Charles. Charles. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I just want to thank uh, all the presentation. It's it's good to see, you know, Parnas taking from ABM from tsunami evacuation to the spread of profit and and for all of you sharing about what you notice, you learn in the conference <laughs> and what is taking you to the next steps. And uh, I'm just listening to the pandemic research as well, it, it brought me to the cross-cutting of pandemic and, and transportation and, and disaster because uh, I've had a experience myself doing, uh, making sure the prevention of COVID, uh, prevention of the spread of COVID through transporting sanitation uh, through 16 different mobile hand washing units that I did. And I thought I should probably explore that uh, it's a case study in the future. So, uh, but uh, it's it's great to see everybody here. Right. Thank right. you. Right. Yep. Uh, sure. Um, sure. What are this is in regards to the LTAP and the TTAP program? What are the opportunities are there for the for the territories for the Pacific territories to participate in? So, in the past, the um, Hawaii LTAP worked with um, like Guam and Saipan, and we did some training there. And so, it, it depends when if the uh, federal government will give us extra funding to do that, especially. So, so we're looking forward to meeting with College of Engineering and maybe exploring that possibility as well. Yeah, thank you, Ginger, for reminding us of the importance of connecting with uh, American Samoa, CNMI, Guam, but also other partners that we work with uh, throughout the uh, out the Pacific. Uh, that is a reminder of uh, two things. First, we will be hosting the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium meetings here in person, March 21st through 24th. So all of our partners from Texas A&M, LSU, New Mexico Tech, CDP, EMI, Naval Postgrad School, uh, and others will be converging uh, on to Honolulu uh, in, in March 21st through 24th. Two weeks later, uh, Primo will be uh, in Honolulu April 3rd through 6th. And we have many, many of our international partners uh, as well as others from not just FEMA, but also NOAA, USGS, US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, NASA, other groups who have uh, come to get US aid uh, and others that will be coming uh, for the Primo meetings April 3rd uh, through 6th. So with that, uh, I hope to see you all there. And if there are no other questions or comments or thoughts, could, have I missed anything? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Ricky, uh, Ginger, and everyone for coming together. Um, that we will make a recording of this and share this uh, uh, more widely. I know that there are others who wanted to uh, participate as, as well too, and we will look forward to uh, future events on third Thursdays. Uh, uh, hopefully more in person, um, but for now in this kind of hybrid format. So once again, thank you all for joining us. Stay in touch and uh, stay safe.